Well, welcome to Going Mental. I'm such a huge fan, so excited to have you here today. Could you please introduce yourself for my listeners? Yes, I'm Melissa Broder. Uh, I'm the author of Death Valley, um, Milk Fed, and The Pisces. Those are all novels. And then the collection of essays, So Sad Today, uh, and five books of poems. I love them all so much. You grew up in Pennsylvania. I did. What was that like? What's, what was your family like? Sure. So, you know, I think that wherever I had grown up, um, it might have been, I've always found it, I've always found reality and living in a body a challenging experience. So I think it's like not so much the where as the what, but um, my um, my mother was a teacher and my dad was a lawyer. I have a younger sister with whom I'm really close. Um, we had rabbits. Those were the only pets we had, Abigail and then Hamlet. <laughs> Um, and, um, I went to an all girls school for 13 years, uh, which at the time I didn't love, but actually looking back, it was awesome. Um, and, um, yeah, I've always been sort of in flight from reality, um, had a, an escapist tendencies and felt just sort of like a discomfort in my own skin. Um, and um, and that was really like my childhood experience. Were you a very creative child? Yes. Yeah, so um, always lived in my mind. Um, and when I was in third grade, um, I started writing poems. And my teacher, Mrs. Hovey, shout out to Mrs. Hovey, uh, said that um, the poems were good. And so um, she gave me this blank book to put them in. And I, I've... Um, thanked her in the acknowledgments of a lot of my books um, because without that encouragement, I don't – like I enjoyed writing poems, but I don't know that I would have stuck with it. Yeah, you got the kind of a little bit of approval or gold star. Totally. The gold star. The gold star. Yes. Um, did you keep a diary ever when you were younger? I did. Um, I started keeping a diary like in probably 10th grade and religiously kept it um, – until I became addicted to the internet and the internet became, became your diary. my diary. <laughs> yes. Do you ever go back and like read your old diaries? They're all in a, in a big bag in my childhood bedroom and I do. And you know, there's always a relief when you look and you see – uh, for me, there's a relief because like I'm, a, I'm very much of the no new problems variety. Like when there's – when – I discover when I think there's a new problem, I get very nervous. But when I'm like, oh, it's an old problem, it's very soothing to me. So I love to look back at my old journals and be like, oh, I was worrying about this 20 years ago. You yeah, know? one in the – like it's I've always been the same. I've always been the same. There's like a – I mean as much as like growth and change are something um, – you know, something we're encouraged to aspire to I think like in this culture and sometimes it's I think – presented, like change can be presented as something to be purchased or something or a finite destination. There's also something really relaxing about um, there's only so much change we can make in terms of like our soul or our character. And um, I don't know, I find that very relaxing. Yeah. And also perhaps not being able to pinpoint an exact moment where these things started. Exactly. Or these issues or anxieties or all the things you write about. Yeah. Birth. Yeah. Birth. Yeah, truly. You or do, pre. You Who do knows? write about pre-birth. Yes. Um, so you graduated with a degree in English and then you went and got your MFA in poetry. Yes. Does not make it rain. Were some of the themes that you expressed in like So Sad Today with your Twitter account, which I want to get into, and then which became a book, were those experiences you went through in college or was that later on? Like what were your college years like, I guess? My college years, um, I was high for about four years. Okay. <laughs> um, I went to Tufts University um, in Boston and um, yeah, I was high. It was great. I Really, I discovered drugs and alcohol in college, and um, I got sober. I ended up getting sober at 25, and I've been sober ever since. But, you know, I've heard it said of drinking and using that it's – first it's magic, then it's medicine, and then it's misery. This is for addicts. You know, for people who aren't addicts, I'm, like, very, like, go to town, right? Like, I'm very pro drug and alcohol, you know, do whatever you want. But as an addict – um, but this, but so I would say those years were the magic years of drinking and using. And um, 
I was sort of a late bloomer. Like I didn't really discover drugs and alcohol until I was around 18. Um, or like things like The Doors movie or Pink Floyd. And um, even though I had always had like a thing for the 60s. But so I would drive around in um, a giant Bronco that had belonged to my grandfather who was then, who had died um, in a giant Bronco with like Jim Morrison stickers on it, asking people like if they really knew what was going on. Um, and I was, a, I delivered pizza in college, which was an awesome job because you could do it high and you could smoke cigarettes while you did it. And you're like, I could still make the delivery and still get paid. Exactly. It was, I, pizza delivery is one, probably one of my all time favorite jobs. Are you open to sharing what kind of substances you did use sure. in college? Yeah. So, um, College was mostly like weed and alcohol. And then after college, um, the alcohol really just Spiral. became, yeah, yeah. And would you say that in the beginning it felt like it was more for exploration and fun and then it it felt like it was more out of control or became escapism? Yeah, I mean, I did a lot of psychedelics in college and that definitely felt like sort of a low-grade connection to a higher power, God. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then... Uh, um, but so, we, and I, but I remember like the first time I got, well, the first time I got really wasted was eighth grade, but then like, I didn't get wasted again until college. And I remember I was just like, oh, this is how you do life. Like this What's is how you wasted live. Yeah. When you're like, wasted. Yeah. Like just, there was a feeling of freedom. Yeah. You know, like freedom from, um, the bondage of me. Yeah, because you write about, you know, the, this feeling of emptiness. Yes. And so I wonder if when you were on the substances, especially at such a pivotal age, you're like, oh, wait, I don't feel those anxieties. I don't feel that depressiveness when I'm drunk, exactly. when I'm high. It gave me a feeling of um, peace and ease, which is something that I think I've been looking for my whole life is just peace, right? Like actually yesterday my therapist, I have a new therapist, um, and she was like, "What? how do you define success? Because I was telling her that, you know, like living – I've now gotten to live my childhood dreams a couple of times by publishing these books – and that was always my dream. Um, and I was like, but it doesn't mean quite as much as it used to or I thought it would. And she said, well, how do you define success? And I was like, peace. Peace. And, you know, a, a feeling of home within oneself. That to me is success. Yeah. Did you feel like you were escaping the anxiety, the internal anxiety and the one you had within yourself? Or did you have social anxiety? I had some social anxiety, but it's really about what's going on in, in, is, in here. In the internal yes. experience. It slowed down my thoughts. Um, it gave me a feeling of elevation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just that relief from the churn. Do you feel like that translated into your work? Um, well, it's funny because, you know, at the time I would have said like, you know, the great writers all use substances. and But truthfully, I don't think I would have been able to, I mean, finish a novel if I, was, if I hadn't gotten sober at 25. I think there's also something about as a writer, I think it's really important to have in editing my work a cold eye, like a really cold eye. And it's very hard. When you're drunk, you sort of have a warm eye. When you're high, <laughs> all writing looks great. You know, I used to think my journals were genius when I was high. And then the next day I was like, I don't understand what this is. You're but, like, what did I write in yes. here? I want to backtrack a little bit because I know we're touching – or I guess it's after college. But how did you begin the So Sad Today Twitter? Sure. So um, in the fall of – I want to say 2012 um, – I went through a period of panic attacks that usually I'll have – I would have them for a couple of weeks and then they would start to abate, but they were not abating. And I was working in an office at the time in New York. Um, I worked for Penguin Books for 10 years as a book publicist um, because, as I mentioned, poetry doesn't make it rain. And at the time, I was just writing poetry and not prose. Um, and the panic attacks wouldn't abate. And I found that when I tweeted – Probably because of the flood of dopamine, there was a feeling of relief I could get out of myself. But um, I didn't want to um, tweet these personal missives about anxiety from my personal Twitter account. So um, I just created this anonymous account called So Sad Today where I could express what I was going through. And um, it started with like 
no followers. I don't even know how anyone found it. Um, I really don't. I think, I guess I followed a couple of people and maybe some of them followed me back and they started retweeting. Um, and that's how it started. It and was it really- it was a viral sensation. It was a viral sensation. Back before, I feel, very early, even what a viral sensation was. It was early. Yeah, I'd say it was early virality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so one day, do you just wake up and you're like, I'm going to tweet how depressed I am? Yeah, it was basically, um, it really started with anxiety and it was just, um, you know, but I, I enjoyed sort of taking what I was experiencing and then telling it slant. So um, finding humor in it. And um, because that to me is redemption, you know, the ability to make something funny or um, beautiful or ugly in an interesting way um, to sort of curve what I'm experiencing and turn it, that to me gives, there's a redemptive feeling to it. There's a feeling of control actually over what, you know, I cannot control. And that's what the account gave me. I also really loved the anonymity. Um, I, it, the account was anonymous um, for, I want to say, three and a half years. Um, what made you decide to finally put your name on it? Well, I had a friend. So, okay. So I moved to Los Angeles in t the fall of 2013 um, because my husband has some health issues. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to be in like a warmer climate and I did not want to move to Florida. Um, and so we moved to LA and um, I used to write my poems on the subway in New York. Really? Yes. Um, and when I moved here, um, I started dictating in my car cause you like can't type poems on the 405 and in, the, yeah, yeah. That bad idea. Yeah. Not advised. You can, <laughs> but it's like not the best idea. And so, um, I started dictating, um, my poems and the line breaks disappeared because I was using Siri and like a notes app. So there weren't line breaks and the language became more conversational and they started to become, instead of poems, they became essays. And so I started publishing some essays online um, as me. Um, and then um, a friend of mine connected me with an editor in New York who was interested in these essays, thinking maybe I should have a book. And um, I told her about the Twitter account. Um, and um, I said, you know, maybe I could publish it like a book of essays anonymously because a lot of the essays had these themes to them of dealing with um, ones th – that sort of dichotomy between the internal world and the external world and trying to rectify the, the chaos of an internal world with living comfortably or somewhat comfortably in the external world. And she was like, well, we'd want you to use your name. And so I thought about it because um, she's like, you already have a name as a poet and the – and some of the essays you've written. And so, and I decided that, okay, I was ready to, to come out as this because I was no longer working in an office, you know, and I, um, I felt that it would be, um, I felt it would be okay. You know, I think like once you have like almost a million followers in a way it's, you can feel more validated about the things you're talking about and less afraid of giving it a name than like when it's, just in a dark corner, if that makes sense. It does make sense. I wonder if when you did put your name out there, did you ever have moments of like, oh shit, I wish I could go back? Definitely. Um, you know, because that because because the anonymous account had been such a respite for me. Um, so I was really scared to come out as so sad today. And I was afraid that, like, you know, I guess it's like a bit of um of um, oh, what is what is the word? Um, like a, a bit of imposter syndrome where, um, you know, I was afraid that people would be like, oh, it's a, this person and it's, they would be like disappointed. But the only thing that anyone ever said was somebody was when they saw a picture of me, they said, oh, she has old knees, which like, <laughs> yeah, they said they were like, oh, she has old knees, which now I'm looking at my knees. But, um, <laughs> no, your knees look good and very tan. Yeah. My knees are okay. But, um, but so old knees was really the only pushback that I got. So that was nice. But just your internal – I mean, I've been front-facing and out in the public, started on Tumblr, la, 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 really long time ago. 
around the same time, 2012, 2013. And I feel like I never had that separation of not being the forward front facing or they know your name or they know that it's attached to you. And so I'm very intrigued by like you experienced both. You experienced kind of really being known for your thoughts out there in animate in anonymity and then stepping into like okay these are my thoughts and and kind of pushing those two identities together i think once i had a lot of followers i realized these are the not just my thoughts these are the thoughts of a lot of people or at least a lot of people um identify with these thoughts and so i'm not alone and maybe i'm not that weird and I think that it was like I needed the mask because I – we all wear masks, right? And I needed that mask of anonymity um, when I felt so alone in my thoughts. Mm -hmm. But um, once I realized these are – there's there's other people – because of course I knew that others have anxiety and depression, but – it can be such a lonely feeling because you look around in the world. I mean, just the other day I had this experience. I was driving down Cannon um, in Beverly Hills where there's – people take a lot of Instagram pictures like with the palm trees. And there were people in the middle of the road just like standing there taking these like cute shots for Instagram. And I was sort of like, do they have this churn? Do they have these feelings? You know, and we don't – and maybe they do. Maybe they don't, you know. But we don't – when we compare, like, our insides to other people's outsides, um, you know, we feel we can feel so isolated. But here I was putting, like, my pure insides out there and other people were responding to them. And I was like, well, maybe my insides aren't so different than the insides of others. And that helped me to feel okay to take off the mask. Yeah, because then you're seeing, what, 10,000, 50,000 people, you know – favoriting it, retweeting it. I mean, it's so fascinating because, again, it's kind of the beginning of this digital social media phase that we're now, like, headfirst in. Yes. Um, and I wonder how that shaped your identity, too. I think I got tired very quickly of doing the account once it was no longer anonymous. Like it felt to me, it didn't feel, I mean, I had also been doing it for like four or five years by the time the book came out. So, um, and now I like very rarely tweet from there. Um, I sort of, it just became less exciting to me, you know, and I, um, I also think that as I started writing novels, um, the world, the element of world building that goes into writing a novel and also poetry, you know, poetry is world building in the sense of I once had a poetry teacher who said to me, uh, you have to teach the reader to live in this world, to inhabit this world. And once you do, uh, you can do anything you want. And I think that's the same as a novel as well. And so I became more interested, you know, it was a different way of disappearing from that inner churn, right, was to sort of um, was the creation of these novels. And also the way, I think that the way, um, novels for me, there's a, there's like an alchemy or synergistic quality where like things will happen in my life. And then that can even go into the novel and it becomes something that I wasn't expecting. And, um, and that's the same sort of, even though there's, a much it's a much longer process and there's much more of a delayed gratification because you never know if a novel is going to be see the light of day right or if people will read it but um the same sort of relief that I got from taking that problem or question or discomfort that I was feeling and turning it into an anonymous tweet um that I I still I get that from from writing, writing the novels, novels. it yes. just you're it's yeah, it's not the instant gratification of tweeting something, seeing like automatic. Yes. You know, people liking, people retweeting. Now you wait like months, years. years. Yeah. How how are you able to sit in that like w or without the gratification? Um, well, I still tweet from my personal account when I need a little hit of dopamine. Although, you know, that's the other thing I think why it became less um 
fun. I feel like Twitter changed a lot. Like it used to be, I love. Now it's not even called Twitter. Uh, yeah. Well, now it's called X, right? I know. I know. I still call it Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. It's I'm better. like, it will always, it will always be she's Twitter. She's always going to be Twitter to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My girl. But, um, you know, I think even before like the muskification of Twitter, um, Twitter used to be this weird world. Like I loved being unverified. You know, it was this place where I could go every day and like my best friend on Twitter who I had never met, didn't even know was like, let's say like it would be like a warthog avatar, right? And I was like, there's my warthog, you know? And and something I think shifted where with weird – I feel like weird Twitter sort of ebbed and um, it became more um, practical – and it became more of a thing for use rather than like a place of this creativity. And I know there's always been news Twitter and politics Twitter, and but um, I do feel like weird Twitter sort of gave way. So in a way, I think as social media has become less satisfying, um, I've been able to have more patience with my novels, but I do miss that instant hit. Do you think that also has to do with like the oversaturation of these social media apps? Because I feel like back in the day, even early Instagram, like now I can log on to Instagram and I see someone with a hundred million followers that I've never heard of. And maybe there's some like K-pop star, some, some South American, you know, very famous person that I've just never heard of. And I'm like, back in the day, I feel like we knew who everyone was that had a lot of followers. It was a smaller pool. Yes. And now it's like everyone's on these things. Same thing with Twitter. Mm -hmm. And now every company's on Twitter and they're trying to sell you a cheeseburger and this and that. And you're right. It is less creatives. Like I almost feel like the magic's kind of been sucked out of. Definitely. The places. Yeah. Um, and... Like that reckoning as an artist yourself, as a writer, that maybe those, I don't know, maybe you took it to books or these other places because it didn't feel as um, magical on those platforms. I think that's very true. That pursuit of magic. And I mean, Tumblr was an extremely magical place. Like yeah, maybe the most. that's where I started my stuff. Yeah. Not that I'm not a writer, but I, when I was sitting with my emptiness and anxiety and feelings and couldn't put them into words when I was 16, 15, I would repost photographs on Tumblr of thing, photographs that I felt matched my internal experience that I had difficulty verbalizing. Mm. And that's, yeah, I'm like, those things don't really exist anymore. Mm -mm. I mean, Tumblr, it's funny, like, I will sometimes go on my old Tumblr because I love like, I really love, like, the VHS stills, mm -hmm. that whole aesthetic on Tumblr. And sometimes I'll even still use them if I have to make a flyer. So I'll go back into, like – and um, it's sad to see some of my favorites have deactivated, you know? Like, I feel like Tumblr got sort of pillaged, too, like, and it got desexified. Like, I feel like the sex police came to Tumblr and – but, um, yeah, I mean, it's like, who knows? That, like, that site could have, like – perhaps saved your life in some ways, right? Like it gave you that creative outlet and that reflection. Totally. And a create like a creative place, right? A creative way. Yeah. To deal. A hundred percent. And I just think also that time period is such a specific snapshot in a society that I feel like I relate to much more than I relate to the one we're in right now. If yeah. that makes any sense. Definitely. I mean you talked about like just the the being sold you know, like the corporate um, inundation. And that's another thing about Twitter too, right? It's like every fifth tweet is from a company you don't even follow. I know. Or on Instagram, on Instagram. every fifth thing is trying to tell me to buy something. Yes. Like maybe every second post yeah. is someone trying to sell me something. And yeah. it's not like back in, you know, 2012, 2013, it's like the fun filtered photo of just like people trying to be more creative, showing what they're doing, you know, the girls with the cut-off shorts and the little filter with their Starbucks. And there was just something so um, childlike mm. about it. A sweetness. Yeah, sweetness. Yeah. I I agree. I also identify with that more than – the world feels – It. Do, I, I wonder – I mean, I'm like, has the world always felt strange to me? Yes. But – 
it does feel very strange, doesn't it? It feels harsh. Yeah. That's how I, how I, I feel these days. Mm. Like it just feels like there's cold corners everywhere. Mm. That's a really good way to put it. Yeah, before it cold just corporate felt, corner. Yeah, cold <laughs> corporate corners. Before it just felt a little softer. Mm. Like everyone was kind of, oh, what is this new thing? Twitter. What is MySpace? What are, what's um in, like on Instagram, and yeah, now it feels very different. And also, I guess part of that is also like I'm older and I'm less naive, and things are less magical. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've you've lived longer, you've lived more, you've seen more, right? Yeah. And yeah. things come back around and it doesn't feel as new. Um, what is your writing process? So um, after I was dict- – so I dictated my essays and I would use um, Siri and a notes app. And, um, and then I came up with my idea for my first novel, The Pisces. I was on the beach in Venice um, and I was reading a book by an Italian writer called The Professor and the Siren um, about a man who falls in love – well, his love story with a mermaid. And I was on the beach and I thought, why is it always a younger uh, – like a, a young woman mermaid and an older man? Why is it never a young – merman and an older woman. And I was also going through something at the time where um, I was mourning not only the loss of um, a lover who I had ended things with, but also my husband and I had had an open marriage for a while and we we closed the marriage. And I was really trying to reckon with um, why is it that like a healthy long-term relationship doesn't feel as intoxicating as some of these relationships that are at a distance or might kill you or, you know, are very fraught. And so I was reckoning with this question and I, the idea of the Pisces came to me and I was like, I don't know if I can write a novel. I've never done this before. I've never written anything that long. And um, so I thought, what if I dictate? And what if I just try to dictate three paragraphs a day and I just see what happens? And um, so I did. And um Within nine months, I had a draft of the book. Um, My next novel, Milk Fed, I also dictated. Interesting. Yes. So that's always like the first round or the first draft. With um, Death Valley, my most recent novel, um, I started by dictation. And then I – I don't know. I think because that book is a book – it's a book largely about really – well, grief Mm – And it's a funny book about grief, but, um, and it was a real connection to my father who passed away a couple of years ago. Um, I think that I wanted to make every sentence a diamond from the beginning because it was really something that I felt was like between me and him in some ways. And so I didn't dictate because usually when I dictate, it's very messy. And I I wanted like a, a certain neatness and a certain like polish right from the beginning. Whereas with my other novels, I usually polish later. Um, but actually I'm working on a novel right now and I didn't think I would go back to dictation. And on my way here, I was just dictating it on the 101. Really? Yes. Yeah. I think that's very fascinating. I always like to hear about different people's processes. I also think you're, correct me if this is totally the wrong word, but would this technically be like the prose or the way it kind of sounds or the sentence is built. Exactly. Is very, okay, thank you. <laughs> yes. Is, um, is unique. I think I've had Tao Lin on the podcast before. And yes. I think your guys' prose is kind of similar in that way where it does almost sound like I can imagine you dictating it or it feels like someone's talking to me, which I love. Yeah. And I think that's what makes your work also so relatable. Mm-hmm. Um, Who are some of the greats or some authors or writers that you are inspired by? Well, it's funny that you mentioned Tao because right before I began writing Death Valley, I read his book, Leave Leave Society, Mm -hmm. which I loved. And Leave Society, I feel like the voice for Death Valley kind of was inspired by some of the auto-fictional quality of Leave Society. Um... And Death Valley, I mean, it's a book where there's a magic cactus and talking rabbits and 
um, you know, it's definitely not completely autofiction at all, right? Like when I was recording the audiobook at the end, um, the engineer was like, is this based on a true story? And I was like, <laughs> Well, I haven't gone inside a magic cactus and encountered my loved ones as children, but, um, but, um, so for each book, you know, I feel like there's different influences for me. Um, I would say for Death Valley, one of my favorite writers is Thomas Bernhard, who definitely struggled with mental health challenges. Um, Thomas Bernhard is amazing, and, um, I would say that he, his writing really influenced parts of Death Valley. Whenever I read Bernhard, um, I start to, I, I think it's very hard as a writer to read Thomas Bernhard without starting to uh, have your sentences take on the shapes of Thomas Bernhard's sentence shapes because he's just so unique and he writes in these really long, curvy sentences. Um, another writer I would say who just overall that I adore is Clarice Lispector. Um, and um, particularly... Uh, the Hour of the Star and The Passion According to G.H. The Passion According to G.H. is a really interesting book because um, for your listeners, I think um, it's really like an examination of um, an existential anxiety. And um, there's also uh, a weird encounter with a cockroach and um, looking at like the question of God and nature – um, but Clarice Lispector is another writer who I love. Um, I also really love books of longing. Um, I tend to – so I love Marguerite de Ross. I would say she's someone who I've read like everything of hers, like everything of Clarice's, everything of Marguerite de Ross, everything. Um, I haven't read all of Thomas Bernhardt's books, but most of them. Um, but I have online um, – I keep a list of uh, my favorite books of longing – um, and there's a whole list. If you Google Melissa Broder Books of Longing, you'll find it. It's on that weird – it's on the book site Bookshop, which I'm is – I'm going to have to check this out. Yeah. And do you ever get nervous or anxious when you read these works that you adore and you love where you, like, question your own writing abilities? I think that, you know, can, there are two contemporary writers. I always say, like, there's really – there's only two writers – contemporary writer, living writers whose careers I feel like, and whose writing and just everything I feel sort of a sense of envy. And that actually really, um, and it's, I would say it's Otessa Moshveg. Mm -hmm. I love her work. Um, and Sheila Hetty. I love her work. And when I read those writers, there's like a, a touch of envy mm -hmm. combined with a wow and, an, and a feeling of inspiration and also how prolific they are that really, um, I can doubt myself, but it really what it does is more spurs me on. And it I sort of you. it inspires me. And I use it. I'm like, you better get to your you better get to your computer right now. I love that. Yeah. Like, I also love that you can acknowledge and share because I think envy is such a universal feeling. Yeah. And people don't talk about it. Yeah. And also people always, at least in my life, they mix up the definition of envy and jealousy. Mm. And I think envy, like underneath a lot of envy is shame mm. and people don't like to talk about it or acknowledge that they have those feelings. And it's so universal part of the human experience to, and I also think envy is not a bad thing. Right. Like you were talking about having a little bit of envy and then it kind of lights the fire under your ass, mm -hmm. which is amazing instead of, you know, there are people who like they fall in the shame spiral of envy and then they feel bitter and they end up not doing anything with their life or you know you could take it in a million different directions so I just want to say loved that thanks yeah I think it's um yeah interesting to think about because you're so successful in your career, but you, you. we're but we're humans, and of course, you're, we look at other people's work and we compare ourselves. And I think, again, that's something that people don't really talk about. Yeah, and I mean, I think to where the quality of envy can come from, right? Like, it's one thing to envy someone who is very prolific or famous, right? for the sake of fame or followers. That's never been my experience. It's It has to be that hybrid of like, I'm in awe of their, like I love their work, I'm in awe of their talent. 
And, you know, I'm like, oh, and they're very popular writers too, right? So it's it's sort of both. And that's why I think for me, like, I love Sheila's work. Um, I love Otessa's work. And they're very prolific, right? And well-received. Um, and also, oh, and neither of them are on social media. And I think that to me is really inspiring, um, you know, in something. In what way can you? There's a... I don't know. There's a feeling of like purity to it, right? Like I'm like, ooh, there. And I don't know why either of them aren't um, on social media. But like what I tell myself is like they are so committed to their craft, you know, that they don't they don't need it. I think about actors and actresses not having social media. I'm just going to explore this thought out loud, see if it comes out correct. Um, like a Natalie Portman or someone. Do you worry that there's um, – like a ser an added seriousness when someone's not online? Yes, but only with writers. But yes, 100%. <coughs> you know, it's that compare and despair thing. Yeah, I was going to say, does that come from like a more self-critical eye? 100%. And it, like w thinking like, oh, would I be successful without the social media? Definitely. Or like that maybe I would have, um, you know, like maybe I would, like I would have, you know, success – but that something about um, the social media in a way like cheapens it, right? Like it's I'm, – I'm cheapening myself with my need for constant dopamine. In the middle of the interview, I had to get up because I started choking. There was a coconut <clears throat> There was a coconut flake incident. I, I, yeah, it's hacking my throat. I'll yeah. put that in the show notes. Yes. You briefly touched on this before, but how do you use comedy or an element of humor to cope with complicated, painful – you know, feelings and emotions? Well, I'll say that, like, I think that with, in part with the So Sad Today Twitter, let's say, um, the the use of comedy, I think it's always come from, to some degree, like a fear of, um, like, telling the truth in its entirety. So if I skew it, then maybe, like, you'll like me more, right? So, like... That would, that's, and like sarcasm can be like a defense mechanism, but I also think that there is like a creativity to humor and um, with things like my book Death Valley, for example, which is uh, about, largely about grief, having to come to, having to go to my computer um, every day and face it, um, there was something about using humor that made me look forward to sitting down. So it's really like, for me, it helps to motivate me. I'm like, if I can entertain myself with humor and see the humor in things, then like, I'm going to stick around at the laptop. And the same could maybe be said of life, right? Yeah, absolutely. That it's almost, obviously, it's more digestible for other people, sure. Yes. But also in a way for yourself. Exactly. To manage the feelings. Exactly. To work through them. They're not so scary and so overpowering. Yes. So I was just about to ask you more about Death Valley, but I quickly want to pivot to milk fed. Yeah. So you write about sexuality and disordered eating in that book. Um, why were those themes important for you to highlight? Um, that book, so I, I feel like my longest relationship is my fraught relationship with food. Um, so like as a kid, I was a closet eater and a binger and then I was anorexic in high school and then I sort of like, I came out of it, um, in my twenties, but like I've always, I've never been like relaxed about food. And so food is really, it is a theme of my life. Mm -hmm. And, um, when I was in college, um, I wrote a really crappy short story about a love affair between a woman who – with an eating disorder and a very Zoftig, um, like, fabulous um, woman who is very comfortable in her body and embraces all the culinary experiences. Um, and it was a horrible short story. But a couple of years ago um, – I just felt that it was something that I've always been meant to write, this love affair, like they want, they needed to live. And so I revisited them and I explored it through the lens of um, the interconnected nature of appetites. So um, there's 
hunger, their sexual desire, but also through like spiritual longing and familial yearning. So I really, um, I, I use the lens of, um, the Jewish religion and, and the way that I was raised, um, which was very, I wasn't raised like very, um, religious, but so one of the characters, the woman with the eating disorder is a very like reluctant, ambivalent Jew. And then, um, Miriam, the more zofted character is Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And, um, that was sort of part of my world building. Would you say that those, every single book, whatever the theme is for that book is something that's personal to you? Absolutely. Yes. It always comes from sort of some questions that I have or a sort of churn or like I'm sort of like an oyster with like sand in its shell. You know an oyster makes a pearl? Mm -hmm. So I'm like this oyster with sand in its shell and like I'll just start emitting this liquid around the sand and the liquid is the words. And sometimes it makes a pearl, sometimes it makes a mess. Um, but – I would say the novels are the pearls and then like the novel that's in a drawer or the unfinished, you know, work is the mess. Mm -hmm. Kind of brings me to the next novel and like themes going on in your life. And so we were scheduled for an interview, I feel like a while ago, maybe like a few years ago um, when your father actually passed away. And so we rescheduled. I know you wanted to take a break for a while from work and go through your experience of grief. Um and then more recently, we rescheduled because you expressed that you were dealing with some mental health stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you'd be willing or open to talking about kind of what you were going through and how you've been able to manage. Sure. So um, in, the f in December of 2020, my dad was in a car accident and that put him in the ICU for six months um, on the East Coast where I'm from. And we weren't able to go in and see him for the first few months because of COVID. And he was on a, re a ventilator and a feeding tube in and out of consciousness. Sometimes he was totally conscious and sometimes not. And um, he had broken his neck in the, in the accident. And um, I, um, you know, I was experiencing what I didn't know at the time was anticipatory grief. And um, I didn't even know, have the language for that. Um, and so my when we weren't able to go in and see him, I was driving um, – my sister lives in Las Vegas, and I was driving like back and forth through the desert to go see her when I um, – would, I drove through this town, Baker, and there was like this giant thermometer. And I imagine – it's the home of the world's largest thermometer. And I imagined <laughs> – in case you're ever <laughs> yeah, Baker, just, just a little stop, note. go see the thermometer. <clears throat> and um, I imagine this giant cactus where you could go in and encounter your loved ones as children and um, – or like get, get more time with your loved ones as they were dying or if, once they died. And that was sort of how the book Death Valley was born – my dad passed away um, about two months after I started writing Death Valley. Um, and I continued to write the book. But through my own grief experience, um, you know, I was a – I didn't know how – I was like, is my grief taking too long? How long is this supposed to last? Also, the feelings were so painful that I was like, it shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't be here. I was comparing myself – to my mother, who's a different person than me, and to my sister, who's a different person than I am, right? And um, and I started to get really focused on, um, like, I wasn't, I didn't know how long grief was supposed to, I mean, there's no supposed to, is I guess the bottom line. But I was like, is my depression getting worse? Is it spawning new babies? Are the babies, are the depression anxiety babies having babies? Like, I started getting really freaked out. And kind of trying to like fix myself and started changing my meds, then changed meds again, um, changed meds again, changed psychiatrists, changed therapists. Um, about a year later, um, I found out that um, an ex of mine had taken his life. And about six months after that, I found out that a friend of my husband's and mine had taken her life. And I think the three events – in turn, really set something off for me where my own concern and fear of about my own mental health really took on like a life of its own. And I became obsessed with, am I suicidal? 
like almost in a hypochondriacal way, yeah. but also, you know, when you've been in grief and you've been in a depression, um, I got really, really scared. And that's actually the the book that I was just dictating on the 101. It's a funny book about suicide. It's a It's about a woman who doesn't know whether she's suicidal or not, which is like a funny thing to not know and to be mm -hmm. obsessed about. And so I ended up doing an IOP for depression and anxiety. And I found that it was making me worse. Like I was becoming more preoccupied and more obsessed with my own mental health to the exclusion of everything else. And then I sort of realized um, through that that um, I have OCD. And it's funny because when I told my two best friends, I was like, I have OCD. They're like, yeah, no shit, you have OCD. They're like, of course you have OCD. Like, are you kidding? But I didn't. I didn't really know. And, and what I realized, what I came to realize is that I have, on top of anxiety and depression, that I have this pure, it's like a pure, oh, more, um, the compulsions I'll do like checking and I'll do, um, you know, certainly spend way too much time on Reddit Googling symptoms and, um, you know, there are compulsions, but by and large, it's this endless loop, endless loop, the endless loop. And am I Okay. I'm not okay. What's wrong with me? You know, the comparing, the all of these behaviors. Um, so I ended up doing like a three-week program for um, OCD, which was very expensive. I really depleted my savings. Um, that also scared me. Um, and um, But I think that when we were going to be doing the recording, I was like – In the midst of in this. In the midst of this. So I could not do the mental health podcast because I was in the midst of a mental health, health crisis. crisis. Right. Which is <clears throat> – that's what's so interesting too, I think, about living with mental health stuff. It's like I can write about this stuff until the cows come home. And I feel very safe and comfortable writing about these things. Um because there is a level of detachment because you are not in the body. Like I remember when I was doing press for the So Sad Today book. It's a book that so much of it is about panic attacks. I mean, I started the Twitter account because of panic attacks. And I was afraid to meet with a journalist from like a major publication. Women's, yeah. Because I'd be – she was coming to like hang out with me for like a day or two. And I was like, what if I have a panic attack? with this person while I'm talking about the book about panic attacks, where I talk so freely about it. And there's just such a difference between the experience of living in a body with these things versus the art of it or the expression of it in words. Completely. I think it becomes a buffer in a sense. There's a sense of safety. Yes. And I want to ask you about your experience, um, how that can differ for you as someone who talks about it versus – living it. When I had first discharged from the hospital and I came up with this idea for a podcast, I was much more comfortable interviewing other people about their experiences with mental health than I was talking about my own. Mm. And there was a safety in asking people like, hey, tell me about your mental health journey and kind of tell me that I'm not alone in these things that I'm feeling or this thing that I went through that I did have a lot of shame about. And slowly, I feel like as I met more people and I got more comfortable, and I also felt like I was getting better, I could slowly – I think I did the podcast for over a year before I even talked about what my diagnosis was publicly. When I would go on other interviews, I would say, oh, yeah, I, I went away for depression and anxiety. That's part of it, but that wasn't the underlying diagnosis or thing that was kind of causing – the other symptoms and yeah I had a lot of shame and so that for me was that was my protection mm. was let me talk to these other people about it um, because it is scary to talk about yourself or the innermost parts of yourself it's it's exactly what you write about like what if I put it all out there and they reject me what if I put it all out there and I can't take it back um, what if I am crazy? Like that was such a loop for me for such a long time. And yeah, it's been very therapeutic. And like now I'll do solo episodes and kind of talk about what I'm going through. I had a singer songwriter on my podcast recently. It's actually my episode coming out this week. I was just editing it on the plane yesterday. And I said to her, 
my friends who are artists, whether that's writers, singers, painters, I've always had a little smidge of envy because I felt like I have so many emotions and so many feelings and thoughts, but I'm not able to put them out in the world in a way that's beautiful, mm -hmm. that like a lot of my friends are able to create something beautiful with their pain and their thoughts and feelings. Um, and so I'm like, I can, yeah, I'm not a writer, I'm not a painter, I'm not all these things I wish I was maybe, but I can sit down and talk to people who I admire and who are and pick their brain and connect on these things that people don't usually talk about. It's interesting. I mean, you mentioned the shame, right? And I think that's, for me, the difference between writing versus living. Writing, I've come to not feel shame in going really deep and going to the vein. Um, sometimes occasionally, you know, when a certain, when like a former boss is like, I read this book, there'll be shame. Or, you know, I questioned w when Death Valley came out, I was like, would my father want his end of life journey, you know, to be, um, even though it's fiction, there's a lot that's based on what he went through in the ICU. And, um, you know, it's would he and and I had those those moments of of shame of like, is it okay that I'm doing this? But by and large, the shame is all it is. My writing is pretty at this point divorced from that. Like mm -hmm. I'm able to put that aside, but the living, the living is still a very um, shame filled place, and it's like. I, you know, I, I had to cancel my book tour for Death Valley um, for the hardcover. I'll, I'll go on a book tour in May for the paperback, but I had to cancel it because I was doing this treatment um, for OCD. And I felt a lot of shame about that. And here's a book where, um, you know, there's a character talking about, like, the effects of grief and depression and anxiety. And yet... Um, as a, you know, as an artist, as a creator of character, it feels very safe for me to do that. But as a human, to have needs, to be imperfect, even though my writing is all about Im imperfection. I mean, people are always talking about my flawed narrators, right? And that, like, I don't write these perfect narrators at all. And um, the, the protagonist, right? Like, the unlikable protagonist, which I'm always like, I like my protagonists, yeah. but I feel very, they're like, how do you do that? And I'm like, it's just natural for me to write these flawed characters because like all human beings are flawed. But to give myself that as a human is like really hard. Yeah. Do you think also because you're able to go back and like edit, you know, a book, it's not like you're putting out the dictation right on the, right out there, that there's a safety also in that? Yeah, experience? the craft. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That you're shaping it to something you are really proud of and feel good about before you put it out in the world. Totally. Whereas living, there's no shaping. There's no shaping. You're going to mess up. Yes. Um, yeah. How has that kind of anxiety like influenced your use of social media? I think that Twitter, I would say if there's a reason why I pulled back from Twitter slash X, it's because um, it's just not as fun anymore, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Instagram, I've come to like more. I just – when I wasn't on Instagram until a couple of years ago. And um, I'd say like four years ago, which was late to get on Instagram. And um, people are very positive on there, I found. Yeah. Like that, it seems to be more, much more positive than – Much more positive than Twitter. Yes, Reddit's the worst. Yeah, Reddit is the worst. Reddit's the worst. You you can't even – I can't even check Reddit. Yeah. Reddit, um, <laughs> I love Reddit, but I don't look myself up on Reddit. Yeah. Yeah. Bad idea. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I find Reddit to be – Reddit is like peak internet to me. Like Reddit is like 
because it's a it's a giant comment section. I think Reddit might be one of the only parts of the internet that I feel like has stayed relatively the same. Definitely. Which is kind of cool. I haven't been on 4chan, so maybe yeah. 4chan is the same if 4chan still exists. But yeah, Reddit still feels like old internet, right? Yeah, I think there's no ads on there maybe or yeah, these big businesses aren't the, on there. That's I think what it is. And it's like this un- – and it's like still feels like unbridled and kind of wild. And it's anonymous. Yes. Like you can't just search by a user, I think. You're right. There's actually no way yeah. to know who someone is unless like they use their name, I guess, as their username. But yeah. Reddit, The Final Frontier. I know. Your next book. I'm yes. just kidding. Um, do you feel like some of your issues or all of your issues, I guess, and what you've struggled with mentally has made you a better writer? Hmm. There's really no way for me to know, you know, because I don't know who I'd be without, without what I've gone through. Yeah, I love to ask like every artist yeah. that like, you know, you write – I guess, about these subjects of the things you struggle with. But, you know, does the pain kind of inspire you? I think it's all, like, part and parcel. But it's funny because um, recently, so we had a mudslide up in the canyon where I live. And um, we all got blo- – my car got totaled. It was crazy. It was, like, Your really car intense. got totaled? My car got totaled. Oh, gosh, I'm so sorry. It was – thank you. Is your you. house Okay. Um, where yeah, you live? the garage was filled with mud. But other than that, it was okay. But um, it took a couple of days for the city to come to, like, clean up the block. And when they did, there was, like, somebody driving a tractor. And I was like, I wish that I wasn't a writer. I wish that I just, like, drove – not just because it seems like it's – a pretty like a lot of responsibility to drive a tractor but at the same time there's the scooping and depositing and to have like a finite beginning and end I was like it would be so nice to drive a tractor it seems really nice to drive a tractor um which is not to say that the person driving the tractor doesn't have pain and agita and suffering but I don't know there seemed something another job that I've always thought would be lovely is uh, being a plumber because I really love plunging my toilet like so funny. the beginning and the end there's something like you know just to have a job where there's like a task with like a beginning and an end that gets completed within the day seems like really um satisfying yeah I guess as a writer you have to start your own like only you are going to make yourself write the book yes and you have to like set aside time to sit down and not let your schedule just get crazy or else you'll never finish anything. Totally. And as a novelist, I mean, it's like you're not finished in the day. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, you're working on something for months. Could be years. Could be years. Um, how are you doing mentally, though? You did the OCD program. I'm not amazing. Yeah. I'm not terrible. Mm-hmm. I think we're all – I also think like I'm still adjusting my medication. I think it's not quite right. Medication is a tough one. It is a tough one. Right? Especially if you're switching around or you don't have like – I feel very privileged and lucky because the first med I ever tried, I had such a good reaction to. I've wow. just been able to stay on that one. I didn't have to try anything else. That's amazing. And I think that's pretty rare. Um, so I've, I've played around with my dosages, but I've only ever been on one SSRI and it just worked for me randomly, like just by luck. That is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, are you on like a S, would you talk about what you're on? Sure. So I've been on Effexor since I was like 24 and, um, I tried to get off of it like maybe 10 years ago and went and tried to transition to Prozac. Um, but when I got to the lowest dose of Effexor, I had like a very, I had like very bad panic attacks. So I ended up, I so then for the the past ten years, I I was on Prozac and Effexor, and those were working really well until my dad died, and then I felt like something just wasn't right. Um, and I don't know whether it was just because of grief, and I should have stayed on. That you know, it's hard to know, right? Like, how well are these things supposed to be working? Like, yeah. you know, we're never going to be exempt from feeling or the human experience, and really, nor should we. You know, but at the same time, uh, that's always a question of mine. I'm like, how well is it supposed to be working? So um, for a couple of years, I did a series of med changes. Now I'm on, um, still on Effexor, but the, we've added um, Luvox. I'm not on Prozac anymore. Luvox, which is um, 
an OCD medication and um, it's really hard on the stomach and also like makes you tired. So that's like sort of what I'm not exactly sure about mm-hmm. right now um, because I'm finding myself very tired and I'm like, am I tired because of depression or am I tired because of the medication? Does it help with the obsessions? I think it does. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's another thing that's so hard about the medication is like, again, we can't go in and take a blood test. Right. And they just tell you, oh yeah, take this, 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 it will be perfect. Yes. Like you're describing your feelings and your symptoms and it's kind of guessing game and... Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's like treating different symptoms. But I really love my psychiatrist. He's... I I finally found someone. He's wonderful. And Shout out to Dr. Bistritsky. Do you see him just for the meds or do you also see a therapist or is he your therapist? I also see a therapist. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't for a little while. I was like, I need a break from therapy because it had been, you know, when I was doing these IOPs and stuff, it was like – Too much. Yeah. It was a lot. When did you start therapy? Oh, my gosh. Uh, (laughs) Age – well, I'm I'm 44 now and I think – Probably like age 20 or 21. Okay. Yeah. What about you? Have you transitioned to different therapists? Men. I did one when I was a kid. My mom passed away when I was a child. So I did one for a couple years – or I saw a therapist for a couple years after that. Stopped. Saw one in high school. Stopped and then have seen two in my adult life. And I still work with my same therapist actually from McLean. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So we just do Zoom because I don't live in Boston. But she has – Changed my life. Really? Yeah. I, for me, when I really met the right fit in a therapist, it was like night and day to every other therapist I'd ever had. Wow. Like I was just like this. I made more change in like a month with this person than I have in six years with several other people. You're making me wonder if I'm with the right therapist. (laughs) Yeah, sorry. (laughs) Um, Yeah. One of my best girlfriends actually just for the first time ever met with a therapist last week and I told her, I was like, you're like interviewing someone. Yes. Like you need to think that if you don't like this person, there's a million therapists out there. There's different kinds of therapists. Like I feel like you need to sit there and yeah, and how can you help me if this is my goal? It's really true. You know, I think sometimes people meet someone and they're like, oh yeah, let me take the first one off the shelf. Yeah. Or we like... It's very easy, I think, to turn them into like mommy or daddy or sort of like, I want to please you. Yeah. Totally. I want you to like me so I want you to like me. I want to be the favorite client. I want to be the easiest client. Yeah. And what have you been working on? Like, have you been taking some of the stuff you learned in the OCD unit? Yes. Um, So trying not to – what have I been working on with OCD? Um, Like living – I I just – I have an article actually coming out um, in Harper's Bazaar called um, I Think This Will Fix Me, How Well Do We Need to Be? It's coming out in like two days and – or I guess it will be out by the time the podcast is out. And um, I interviewed my – the woman who heads up the OCD IOP that I did. She's like a real personality and she's like – she's like nobody heals. She's like you don't heal. You heal by living. And she, I think what she, and she was talking about for, um, for OCD, but I think it's like, um, in terms of, you know, you can like sit like for mental health OCD, right? It's like this sort of, I can sit there being preoccupied with my mental health and I'm not, oh no, like I'm not well enough to do this. I'm not well enough to do that. What if, but the truth is, um, the more I live, the more I do sort of the more self-esteem I have and the better I feel. Yeah, and you don't get stuck in the the loop, the endless loop of the it loop. all. And yes. then that becomes kind of a blockage. Yes, you know the loop. Yeah, I, I know the loop very well. <laughs> um, my meds help a lot with my loop. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah. Do you mind if I ask what med? I'm on Lexapro. Oh. Pretty, I am on 10 milligrams. And when I first went, before I went to the hospital and really was feeling chaotic and out of control, I was on 20. Mm-hmm. And I felt a bit numbed out. Mm. So while I was in this program working on a million different types of therapy and doing – like learning all these behavioral skills and probably similar stuff to what you learned in the OCD unit, honestly. Totally. Um, I was able to scale down my meds and, yeah, have been now steady on them for a couple of years. But I don't know if you – 
are familiar, but so I have a personality disorder. Yes, I knew I you have BPD, right? <clears throat> yes, yes, I have BPD. And before I went away, I mean, I had never even heard of BPD. I had no idea what it was. And I knew, okay, I, I have this feeling of emptiness and I feel really anxious sometimes. And I, not panic attacks, but like debilitating anxiety where I'm not eating, I'm not sleeping. I can feel depressed and not want to get out of bed for days. And I was just like, what did you say to me at the very beginning of this interview? You said like a jumbled soup, a depression anxiety soup. That is how I felt. And I think what was so confusing for me is I didn't know why. Not that you need to necessarily know why to work on these things. But for me, I'm like, I know what I'm feeling's not healthy. Mm. I don't feel normal, but I don't know why. Like, I feel like there must be a reason why. And I got the diagnosis and I was like, finally, like a light bulb moment. I was just like, this is why I've been feeling all these things. And it was life changing, fully changed my life. Wow. So I feel like once you know what you're dealing with, then you can treat it. Yeah. And I had done all these therapies and all this stuff, but never really working on the root issue. The root. Yeah. No, I know. I actually, um, I've been looking into lately like CPTSD and um, I'm like, is this the root? I'm still not sure what my root is. Um, You know, and I'm trying not to, I try not to take too many quizzes online. Yeah. Yeah. For the root, but. Oh, yeah. yeah. I I remember before I got the BPD diagnosis, I thought I had, there's this thing called relationship OCD. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I went and saw an OCD specialist. I was like, I have relationship OCD. Like all my issues manifest when I'm in romantic relationships. I must have this. And he was like, no, I actually think you should go meet with a DBT person and then Mm -hmm. slowly went on this wild goose chase and got my diagnosis. But DBT and DBT is very good for BPD, right? Yeah. So it was actually created for people who struggle with BPD was um, initially what it was de- designed for. But now they use it for people who have eating disorders, substance abuse issues, like all these different things. Yeah. And yeah, it, it's been really helpful. That's the type of therapy I do. DBT. Yeah, DBT. Um, What's your favorite DBT tool? Well, I guess different tools, different moments, but... Yeah, I would say what I'm working on right now is the this idea of like a dialectic, mm-hmm. um, which is dialectical behavioral therapy, so that two things can exist at once. They don't cancel each other out. Like people with BPD have very black and white thinking. Yes. And like once you get emotional or activated, it's like tunnel vision. And so... As I haven't been in crisis or chaos for a long time, I've now been able to kind of calm down and work on like the longer standing things. So yeah. That's what I'm working on right now is, yeah, not getting stuck in that tunnel. The dialectic. Yeah, the dialectic. Yeah, and it can be hard too because when it's like when it's thoughts, okay, when it's feelings, okay, but when it's thoughts and feelings at the same time, it's very hard <clears throat> to like – Navigate. Yeah. I know when I read your book, So Sad Today, many of the themes you wrote about, I mean, I read it years ago, but I've actually reread it a million times, but I really related. I think you had like a whole short story on that feeling of emptiness, yes. on getting the external validation and dopamine online and just all of these things that I feel like you were very a part of my internal journey, actually. It's amazing. And it's really interesting. Do you, so this next book you're writing about is suicide. Yes. And you lost two people to suicide. Yes. What is kind of the viewpoint of the book? It's a funny book about suicide. So it's, it's fiction. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, there's a, the person that this character loses, um, is a fictional ex-lover. So it's not my ex-lover. It's fictional. Um, but, um, it's really, um, an exploration of, um, the question of why do each of us live and how do we make meaning and, um, you know, why do we go on and how that's 
answer different. Some people don't even think about that. Um, but how that is answered differently by each of us. Um, and also the humor of, um, I think the voice is very humorous, right? And a character who is, um, and, and also I think it's a book about um, looking for that answer, wanting that one thing, right? I mean, you talk about the dialectic, right? Like I've wanted that one thing so that I can just be okay, right? Like, and be okay is not the dialectic, right? Be okay is one side mm -hmm. or be okay is being able to hold both things, right? Like darkness and light and, um, and not say like, well, I'm not okay because there is darkness, right? But to, to hold both, but holding both is so challenging. Oh my gosh. It's so challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, it's just, but it's just easier to hold one. Yeah. Like I can only see one. Totally. Um, it sounds like actually all of these deaths were sudden. Yes. What and your dad getting an accident was sudden too. Mm -hmm. Um what has your experience been like with grieving these sudden you know people moving on? Well, with my ex, I really um I felt that I had grieved him so much while he was alive. If that makes any sense. Yeah, cuz like the relationship was over. He was the inspiration for the merman in the Pisces. So it was someone who was really important to me. And also appears in So Sad Today a number of times. Um, and um, when I found out that he had died, um, it, it was a couple of years after he had actually died. So that was really tricky because we had had like a no contact thing and we were good, you know. And and there wasn't guilt of like – I didn't think that I had had any like impact on it because it was a couple of years after we had ended. And I know that he had other relationships since we were together. But um, – it was a feeling of horror and um and what i and i felt like i've grieved this person while he was alive and i i was like i can't do any more grief and so i tried to avoid thinking about it feeling it and unfortunately well for better or for worse you can't mm -hmm. it always catches up to you it always catches up to you yeah, we have to face things. But I guess we also have to face things in our own time, in our own way, you know? And, um, yeah. And with your friend, like, with your – the other person in your life, was it a similar experience or – That was um, – it was more just, like, the icing on the suicide cake. Like, I was just, like, how is this happening again? Yeah. You know, like I, I, I was like, how is this happening again? And um, I felt a lot of anger about that. Actually. Yeah, I was going to say grief can take us to places we don't recognize. Mm -hmm. And obviously you associate it with deep sadness yes. and like longing. But also there's a component of anger many people experience. Yeah. How did you, do you feel like you've worked through that? Or you're mm. working. Yeah. Working. And I think writing for me, as hard as it is, like sometimes when I'm opening my document for this book, I'm just like, oh, I'm like, ugh. I mean, it's like therapy. I got a face. Yeah. It's total therapy. Yeah. You're like, I'm not avoiding the feelings. I'm really also thinking about what do I think. Yes. Um, are you religious or do you believe in like an afterlife at all? That I'm not sure about. Um I do um, have a meditation practice and I sometimes pray, um, but I don't have like one religion. I don't, I, I'm, I would say I am an agnostic who very much needs a relationship with a higher power. So I have one. Yeah. What about you? It's a work in progress. Um, <clears throat> I was raised really religious, very Catholic. And I totally walked away and for a long time felt like I don't believe in God. I really rejected the rigidity that I grew up in. Mm. And now as I'm a little bit older, I would consider myself more agnostic. Mm -hmm. Like if one day I would love to be, I'm not a very spiritual person, but I think I kind of avoid even thinking like what happens when we die and I don't like to go there. It doesn't make me feel good. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I the truth is I I think as my philosophy is like as we believe is mm-hmm. what we believe is. And so after my dad died, there was there were definitely like I got very into signs and I would look for signs and I got them all the time, right? But if I didn't believe, if I wasn't looking, then there wouldn't be, right? And sometimes in my life I forget to look or I it's too painful or I shut it down and then there are no signs. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes I really need them and then there are. And I feel the same way about God. Like if I look and if I believe, then God is everywhere and namely in here. And when I don't look and I'm focused on – um you know, something like shopping for a new car or, um, you know, the internet or whatever it is, then there isn't. Yeah, I think it's a process. Yeah. Some people it's not, but for us, maybe it is. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we all have complicated relationships, you know, with our family, with our parents. How do we not feel regret when someone in our life is gone? I think, well, I was very lucky to be able to, once COVID ended, to really be able to show up for my dad. And that was, which not everyone can do. I I felt like the dying process for me was not challenging. It was actually really, well, it was, it was less challenging. It was very beautiful. It was much less challenging for me than after. Um, Whereas I think for some people, like, um, the showing up can be hard and after they're able to sort of – like my mom, I think, like it was very hard for her to like go to the hospital and and it was very easy for me to do that. I just like did it, you know. Um, I wouldn't say easy. It wasn't pleasant, but it was – And but there were moments that were pleasant and beautiful and funny and – um. but I think after my mom was able to like navigate her grief more easily, whereas like after I was – more of a mess and so but for me I think showing up for the people in our lives and knowing that we showed up the best we could helps you yeah what about the aftermath was so difficult because then I was like alone with myself and your thoughts and my thoughts yeah whereas I guess when you're going through the actual process and this person's still there you're hyper focused totally. you have something to focus on yes yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And so from the time that he was in a car accident to when he passed away, how many months was that? Six months in the ICU, which is a really long time. That's a really long time. Yes. And did you know right away they said he might not come out of it? Or yeah. You... Okay. Yeah. Because to me, then that is very, very different than the experience of losing two people to suicide. Right. So it's kind of the slower exactly s- time to say goodbye type right. of thing versus the sudden. Yes. That's really interesting. Yeah. And did you feel like one was easier than the other? Also, you had different relationships, so they're not super comparable. It's hard to compare them, yeah. right? How do you compare? It's hard to compare to the mm-hmm. multiple deaths, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where do you feel like you're at in your grieving process now? I think that – I think I'm moving through actually pretty well. Um, I think I'm – I mean writing is definitely – I have to face it. Mm-hmm. Writing and writing about the subject is a facing, is a reckoning. Has there been anything you have learned about grief or death that you want to share with my listeners? Sure. Um I have found that I we can't avoid. I think there are some people who do avoid. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or who live in a total state of avoidance. Yes. My family is very avoidant. Yeah. But some people are very successful at that. You know what I'm saying? Like my mom is great at being avoidant and I always think like, oh, it's going to catch up with her and then it doesn't. You know, she just continues to avoid. But then there are some of us who can't afford to avoid. We just can't. You know, maybe we're more sensitive. I don't know what it is. And I've tried. But it didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. What about, yeah. Or it like destroys you almost. Yes. It, you know? Yes. My therapist always says this to me. She was like, you can, 
I'm going to butcher the way it comes out. Like you can run away from yourself or go somewhere else and there you still are. Yeah. Like you'll always still. And we are who we are. That's the thing. Like, because I'll compare myself to my mom. Like I'll be like, well, she doesn't have to seemingly have to face this stuff. Like why doesn't she have to face this stuff? And it's like she's a different person. Mm -hmm. And that's just it. Um, and like I said, I wish that sometimes, I, I often wish that I wasn't sensitive, you know, just like I wish that I drove a tractor. But maybe you wouldn't then have this gift. Yeah. But I'm like, is it worth it? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Those are kind of like existential, larger than life questions. And the, and the deal is, is. I do have this gift. I am who I am. That's it. It is what it is, right? But you've also helped a lot of people. Thank you. Like as someone who also feels like you've helped me, like I feel like I read your writing and I'm like, oh, I I know that feeling. Mm. And I'm not able to put that into words, but she's able to put into words that feeling. That And look at how many people buy your books and how many people even signed up to your Twitter. Yeah. Like, Every single one of those people relates to what you write about. Totally. That, that is always funny to me. Like, I don't know. I guess the ability to put it to words, it does come. It's what I do. Yeah. Do you feel like you sometimes have like a higher purpose? I also knit. <laughs> I love knitting. I, but that's more recent. Um, sometimes I do feel like I have a higher purpose. Yes. Sometimes I'm annoyed about it. I'm like, oh, I wish I didn't. But Yes. What about you? I don't know. I think I, I'm a very self-critical person. Same. Um, and something I work on. But I think I wax and wane with that. Sometimes I feel – I'll feel very sure of myself and confident and like, oh, I, I know why I'm doing this. Or it's just an internal pull, internal feeling. And then other days I'm like, oh, I suck and – I was bad at that and I need to go crawl in a hole. So it's the flip-flopping between those two. Good days, bad days. Trying to have okay days in between and just hold steady. The totally. dialect again. The dialectic, yeah. right? And like not being perfect, um, whatever perfect is, but not being perfect at, uh, according to your own standards doesn't mean you're like bad. Right? Yeah. And dialectic. Yeah, yeah. It's that you can not be perfect and that's okay. Yes. And also most people are not perfect. No. In fact, probably everyone. Yeah. Yeah. My new thing is that I'm like, I, I sleep too late. Like I'm like, I sleep too late. I don't do it. I don't get anything done. I sleep too late. And my therapist is like, I want you to for a week, like write out everything you do each day. And then we'll look at it and we'll see if you really do nothing. And I'm like, okay, I guess I don't do nothing. I'm like, I just do it a little later in the day. Yeah. And so that's, so, I mean, it sounds like it's been helpful. Yeah. That's pretty cool, actually. I like doing CBT work. I like homework. I like homework too. DBT is very homework oriented. A lot of homework. Almost like too much homework actually. I'm like I'm back in school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're still you're still doing homework. I do some homework sometimes yeah. depending on what I'm struggling with at the moment. It ch it really changes. Like I have my week to week is so different. Mm. And if I need to like add a session in a week or if I need to I'm traveling right now so like I'm not doing therapy this week. It, I also just started family therapy, actually. Oh. Yeah, I had okay. did, done it before, and I'm trying it one more time with my dad. All right. And uh, so far, so good. Amazing. Yeah. Same therapist? Same therapist. Same therapist. Yeah, I, before we worked with a different therapist. But I'm a huge – therapy has changed my life. But again, for people who avoid, it's really uncomfortable. Yes. Like it's – self-examination and kind of looking in the crevices and looking at the parts of yourself that you don't love. Yeah. It's hard. It's really hard work. Yeah. Um, when does your new book come out or um, you're still in the writing process? I'm in chapter five. So I, I don't even know. Okay. I don't know when I'll be finished. Yeah. Um, I'm like thinking of any little fun questions that we could end on. Yeah. Something like sexy or funny or exciting. Um, how long have you lived in L.A. now? 
I've been in LA for 10 years. Oh, okay. Um, is there anything you like love to do with your free time or anything like interesting or funny that I should check out while I'm in LA or? Totally. Um, well, I was going to say now, I don't know if I recommend this for like the young, but like now that I'm a knitter, like shout out to Jennifer Knits, um, in Brentwood. I love, I love Jennifer Knits. Um, the John Waters um, exhibit that's going on right now, if you like John Waters. I love John Waters. Okay, so there's a John Waters exhibit um, going on with like um, costumes from all of his movies. Oh, so and cool. I'm going to go to that. So that, that's what I would say to hit. And it's that's going on until August. So anyone listening to this, even months down the line, it'll be here till August 2024 at the Academy of Motion Picture Museum. Piano, I don't know, like, Piano museum? I forget what they call it, but I'll look it up. Yeah. Um, is there anything else? Like any words of wisdom or anything you've been that you feel like putting out there in the world? Mm, good question. Um no, I, I really like that you talked about the dialectic and that actually I hadn't thought about it in a while. And um yeah, I think that uh I guess what I'll tell the listeners is what I need to tell myself, right? The advice we give to others is always the thing we need to hear ourselves. And like, um, you're not that weird. You're really not. Um, you're not alone. And you're not alone. Yeah. Exactly. 